Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, evening's event. Uh, welcome to the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences. My name is Kumar Murthy and I'm the director of the Institute. Whether you're joining us from uh, Toronto or from anywhere else in the world, I hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. The Fields Institute is physically located at 222 College Street in downtown Toronto. And I take this opportunity to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto and the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. As you may be participating from elsewhere, may we suggest that you research the history of your land using the website nativeland.ca. You may already know the Fields Institute through attending or participating in one of our programs or events. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Fields Institute is a network of 20 universities, federally funded through uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, of Canada and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, provincially through the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, and also by the National Science Foundation of the USA, the Simons Foundation, and by individual generous donors such as yourselves. Our activities span a broad spectrum of research in the mathematical sciences. In the last three months alone, we have hosted more than eight workshops and 20 seminars. Throughout the pandemic, our network has been supporting public health decision makers using advanced mathematical modeling techniques in areas as diverse as border crossings, mobility, opening and closure of public spaces, the economic impact of interventions and variants of concern. And you can find out uh, more details about our activities in this area on our website. Well, the pandemic has now been with us for more than a year and all of us have made enormous sacrifices to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. And we do know that public health measures work. Though caseloads are high right now, we're actually decelerating as the latest figures that I just checked show. But we're in now in another difficult phase of the pandemic caused by variants of concern that spread faster than the wild strain. And the question uh, that we're asking ourselves is where do we go from here? This evening, we're happy to, to host this town hall to discuss just, just that, and to also try and address uh, some of the questions you have about the pandemic. This is the second event the Fields Institute is organizing around this theme, what the numbers say. The previous one was about two months ago. We have two members of the science advisory table, both extraordinary researchers, extraordinary communicators, and I would say also extraordinary human beings and we're delighted that they're able to join us. Uh, Peter Juni is, uh, is the scientific director of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Table. In normal times, he's director of the Applied Health Research Center at the Lee Kaching Knowledge Institute of St. Michael's Hospital. Peter is internationally renowned for his clinical research on the management of cardiovascular and musculoskeletal disorders. Peter has played leading roles in major cardiovascular trials and served on task forces of the European Society of Cardiology. Peter holds the Canada Research Chair in Clinical Epidemiology of Chronic Diseases and is a professor at the Department of Medicine and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. And I would add that Peter's by now become quite a familiar face to many of you as he's often called by the media to help people understand where we are. Peter, welcome to the meeting. Thanks a lot for having me. Our second panelist is Samira Mubaraka. She's a research scientist working at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center with expertise in how viruses spread, particularly through bioaerosol dispersion. Early in the pandemic, Samira and colleagues isolated the SARS-CoV-2 virus and are working feverishly to isolate the variants of the virus to characterize them experimentally whilst looking for new and emerging variants in our patients. She serves on the COVID-19 panel of the Chief Science Advisor of Canada, the Implementation Committee of the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network, the Viral Sequencing Project with Genome Canada, and Ontario Genomics' Steering Committee 
for the Ontario COVID-19 Gen Genomics Rapid Response Coalition. She's also the chair of the Ontario Academic Health Sciences SARS COVID-2 Sequencing Network. Welcome, Samira. Thank you very much, Kumar. Most welcome, Nand. So the, uh, 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 both uh, Peter and Samira are extremely busy individuals. And so we're really happy that they took the time um, to out of their busy schedules to join us this evening. Now, in, in sort of uh, trying to frame the discussion, of course, there are a lot of uh, topics we could cover, but we also asked the public to send us questions that they were interested in, in talking about. Uh, we got quite a lot, uh, large number of questions, and we won't be able to uh, 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 reach all of them. I have selected a subset of the questions to discuss and sort of things, questions that sort of fit into a pattern. And I apologize in advance to those whose question was not selected. And I hope we will try to, we'll be able to include your question in a, in a future event. I don't think this will be the, the last event that we have on this subject. So let's begin maybe first, uh, Peter, if I could ask you, just give us a quick rundown on where we are right now in terms of the numbers uh, case loads, hospital occupancy, ICU occupancy, just in rough terms. Yes. Um, so I start with the good news. It doesn't look um, in terms of the case numbers anymore as if this is completely and utterly out of control. What happened now is that the, um, the measures that were taken about two weeks ago started to kick in so that the curve appears to flatten. And this is still a wobbly story and we're just talking about flattening. This doesn't mean that we're actually over the hill. We're not at all over the hill, obviously. What happens now is that after the cases, you know, this early indicator, uh, is, uh, is flattening what will happen with uh, hospitalizations. They will continue to go up um, for a week, for two weeks. We will see until they would be flattening at the very high level. And ICU admissions, intensive care uh, admissions, and then occupancy will continue to go up for at least three weeks. Uh, so um, the next three weeks of growth in ICU occupancy is just baked in. This makes it extremely important now that we don't only flatten the curve, but we need to get these case numbers down. They need to plummet. They really need to plummet. So we need to get better. We need to take more measures. And we just need all of us to help. Every single one can help. That happened now in the past. My impression is that during the last week or so, there has been you know, a shift in the province, which I'm extremely grateful for. I've, you know, There's so much solidarity going on you know just among people in the province if we continue to do the right thing we will get this bugger under control so just just to understand again and to clarify something you said that uh, um, there's a time lag in between the uh, when a uh, public health measure is introduced and when we see the effect in terms of cases or in hospital occupancy or in icu is that correct Yes, this, this also makes it so difficult to understand for many people. You know, there are a few challenges and that's one of them. You start to step on a break and the first signal you will see after 10 to 12 days or so. This is like what we're doing here is it's like uh, driving a self-accelerating car. If you don't uh, step on the brake, it will continue to accelerate more and more and more until you, until you crash into a wall. But if you start to, uh, to, to uh, step on the brake, you won't see anything for at least 10 to 12 days if it comes to case numbers. But is, what is much more concerning, you won't see after that for another two to three weeks, nothing if it comes to ICU admissions and occupancy. They will just continue to go up. This makes it so challenging. And that's now one of the reasons, you know, that also politicians across the world all so much struggle Exponential growth may be very straightforward for people like you guys or me, but of course it's very difficult to understand. And now with the third wave and with the fatigue that we're in and with the challenges that we have now, that the measures that worked before relatively okay, even if you've made political compromises, these measures won't work that well anymore. Why? Because these new variants are about 50% more transmissible, meaning if we did something before and cases started to plummet, it won't happen that way anymore. Cases will still go up if we do the same as before. This was the challenge at hand. 
So we have to do better than before. We have, we have to do better, even though we're all so tired. Yes. Right, right. Just to reinforce your uh, statement about the flattening of the curve and uh, the, uh, the, the effect of the uh, measures introduced a couple of weeks ago, we've also been tracking the acceleration of, of the uh, virus. In other words, how quickly the growth has been increasing. And we, we are right now in a, in a phase of deceleration. In other words, the, the rate at which the growth is increasing is going down. Um, so that's, that's another piece of good news. Uh, Samira, I wonder if I could ask you just in response to this issue of where we are with uh, ICU occupancy and hospital occupancy. I know that Sunnybrook has set up a field hospital to deal mm -hmm. with the overflow in the ICUs. ICUs are stretched beyond capacity and this must be a huge challenge for frontline workers. Uh, tell us a little bit about the numbers there and the challenges you're dealing with in real time. Yes, thanks, Kumar. I have to say this, this third wave has made the second wave feel like a walk in the park. I never would have said that back in December, but uh, this, uh, this is unprecedented. I'm reiterating, I think, what many people already know, but uh, it's... Non-capacity, and this must be a huge challenge for frontline workers. Uh... And um, I think that, um, so our numbers have looked not dissimilar to what Peter's already described. So we had a rapid ascent, you know, sort of this idea of an accelerating vehicle, you know, there was certainly a sense of momentum, which was out of control with a little bit of a, a, a plateau. Now, whether, you know, and I, I just mean in the recent 24 to 48, maybe 72 hours where things have sort of calmed down a little bit. But we know from previous that they could also go back up. We don't know what the, um, you know, what the net seven day average will be in terms of our admissions. We, you're correct in that we do have a, a field hospital and this really underscores the importance of emergency preparedness. I feel a little bit better knowing that it's there um, if needed and it's, it, it was preparing to accept patients this week. Um, obviously, any kind of activity there will be will be staged and progressive. So, taking small numbers of patients and 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 increasing, if need be, uh, you know, at its limit, could probably take a hundred patients. We hope we never see that. Also, in anticipation, um, Sunnybrook opened a second COVID inpatient unit. So, it was initially one, in addition to our critical care units, but now there's a second COVID inpatient unit. And the idea for the field hospital really is more for recovered patients. So hopefully the most stable COVID patients while the really acute, acutely unwell and critically unwell will be, will be managed um, on the hospital side. In terms of the challenges, there, there, there are a number. Obviously logistics is, is obvious, We've never done this before. And I've, I've been absolutely blown away and impressed by how this has come together in a fairly short um, amount of time. But uh, I, I've heard other people say a bed is just a bed. There's so much more that needs to come with a bed. And this is true. You can have a lovely you know, mobile health unit, but unless you have staffing for it, Mm -hmm. and expertise and all the support as well you know some of the details around how are we going to get x-rays done how are, how are results going to be phoned back these are you know what seem may seem like minor details but when it comes right. to individual right. patient management are absolutely critical right. Right. i think some of the other challenges are around what's happening to the healthcare workforce right now there's certainly we've heard a lot about um, burnout, but I think it's being compounded also by a degree of, of, you know, moral injury in a way, people having to make some pretty uh, tough decisions. And, and I do worry long term how this can be sustained. I think it's going to be really important that supports are put in place. I, I heard a number earlier today that a number of um, uh, healthcare workers are likely to leave the field or the sector after the pandemic, um, given, given what's happened, you know, and this could have very long-term repercussions just in term of, terms of our general, you know, healthcare delivery. Uh, and of course, you know, just at the patient level, what's happening now as, you know, younger people are being admitted and seem to be very, very unwell. And as this um, wave progresses, we take, we take significant steps that have impact not just on COVID patients, but also on every other patient that utilizes the healthcare system. So no doubt many of you have heard 
about delayed or canceled elective surgeries or, or cancer surgeries. Um, all patients are now limited in terms of their, the, the visitors that can come in. So generally speaking, there's just less support at the individual patient bedside for those patients. Um, so there's a, there's a lot going on um, that doesn't just start or finish with, with, with the COVID patient and, and, and the COVID units. It has repercussions across the entire institution and I'm sure institutions across the province and the country. Mm. So I, I guess it's uh, sometimes we take for granted how, how good our health system is uh, how good our care, health care is uh, in hospitals and so on. And uh, when it's stretched to the limit as it is now, then, then we see uh, how great we should be for how well it works when under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder then if we could talk a little bit about uh, uh, the modeling predictions for the near future. Peter, there was an interesting slide that uh, Steiny Brown had in his presentation last week uh, on some scenarios showing the uh, effect of a stay-at-home order um, together with increased vaccination. And uh, I wonder if you could walk us through these numbers and help us understand uh, what is being said. So it's very good. As I'm saying it, you're pulling up the slides. That's great. <laughs> That's very good. Trying to at least, yes. But uh, now, can you guys? Uh, I'm not sure what I do see. here with the uh, with with the Zoom thing, but I think you can see everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the slide. slide this is huh? it. Exactly. This is the one. And I just try to decrease the size a little bit so that I can yep. see it myself as well. Okay. So how do I get rid of that? So wonderful. So I can see actually my screen. <clears throat> so. Really important, you know, just uh, to understand once more, these were always, you know, discussions that were ongoing. What do these predictions actually mean? And um, what do we actually show just in here? We need to be aware of, and that's something, again, which is challenging to understand from, you know, the perspective of somebody who is outside, that um, the predictions we're making, um, this, you know, prediction that we just have here, this first maximal one. That's a prediction um, that is based on the trajectory we were in when the prediction was made. So if we continued the same way we were here, you know, in the last phase of, the, uh, of this epidemic curve and we just continue uh, on the same trajectory, what happens is this is that, that not a straight line is coming, you know, despite the fact that uh, vaccines are coming, etc., and that the weather is getting better and people are coming out, going out. But what you see is there is indeed acceleration happening with this curve here getting steeper and steeper and steeper. Um, and if we were or had been, luckily now, just on the same trajectory, stuff that has happened in, uh, in other countries and would just have tried to vaccinate our way out of the pandemic and would have experienced, you know, warmer weather with people going out more. We would have experienced um, just a, a peak here, thanks to vaccines, the peak, otherwise it would have gone up more, um, of roughly 30,000 cases before slowly just going down just here at the other end of this uh, epidemic curve you know and this would be just if you continue stay asleep on the steering wheel nobody does anything that what we have would be happening and that we then basically have here this curve flattened and then bent downwards that's the effect of vaccinating daily with 100,000 doses in the province, one dose per person, that's what would be happening. And you remember, you know, many people, including myself, said we can't vaccinate ourselves out of this third wave. That's impossible. This would have ended in a even much, 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 much more dramatic challenge. That's what you see here. Now, you remember we had the, uh, the public health interventions that started to kick in stepwisely. And we also clearly had, you know, a task of keeping everybody informed, you know. So in these situations we're in, the most important part 
part from my perspective is information for everybody and consistent information you know we need to keep the people of this province aboard and in addition we need to give structural measures that allow to decrease contact rates. It's all about decreasing contact between people. You know, viruses don't, as Samira knows much better than I do, viruses don't have legs or wings. They need people. So if people don't meet anymore inside, what will happen? We will be able to start to, you know, get these, um, this curve that you see here under control. Remember what we said, if you step on the brake of the self-accelerating car, it will take about 10 to 12 to 14 days, depending on some time lags with, uh, with reporting, until you start to see a reaction. And what we then see basically is on the, the same um, assumptions as before um, regarding vaccines, uh, and then an uh, just an assumption that we would do public health measures for four weeks, you would start to see under moderate public health measures, the flattening that we're now talking about, you know, this flattening could come a bit earlier or a bit later, depending on the, the behavior of people. It's all about every single one of us. And obviously, um, if we then were to open after four weeks again with relatively weak measures, what happens then again, we, can, we start to go again into an exponential growth. But what we then see is that, um, the, that, that uh, yeah, under the, the situations we're in, we're then sl uh, just uh, slowly then again just approaching after a while, delayed here, a hill, the top, and then will slowly go down. But when you look at the numbers, you know, even if we start now a bit earlier, you know, to flatten, which, which is great news, um, if we open up, these numbers would be far too high to get things under control. What we then see here, this, uh, this next curve, the dashed yellow curve here, is the same moderate public health interventions. Um, for six weeks, same intensity, you know, the way we had it when we started with the public health interventions again, just about two and a half weeks ago or so. So the problem with this, these curves is you basically just move along a high plateau. And remember what we said with the baked in ICU admissions, with the baked in hospitalizations that continue to go up with younger people more severely ill being on the ICU, also staying longer on the ICU, it would be untenable, you know, to be on any of these trajectories. Now, even if we do that moderately for six weeks. Yes. So, Peter, just to interrupt. So this yellow curve, uh, what you're explaining is that uh, the, the, the effect of the interventions keeps it down for a little while. And then once their, their effect is over, we start growing again. But the reason it bends... At the, at the higher plateau at around uh, 17,000 is because of the vaccination. Is that this right? is correct, yes. So what you see here, what you see here, this part is basically mostly the public health interventions. And then you start to release them about here where my cursor is. I'm not sure whether you can see the cursor. Yeah, see and then about 10 days later, we start to go up again. And a little part of what you see here that this is bending is already a little bit an effect of the vaccines, but very subtle. It's very subtle. So if you then start to, uh, you know, uh, not, not step on the brake again, what happens, you start again to see growth. And then this part of the bending, that's then the effect of, uh, of vaccines kicking in more. But then we're already, as you see it here, we're then already uh, end of June. And then the green curve that you see down here is again the same story. If we're really hard... That's the advantage then, you know, what you see. If you, if you suffer um, even just for four weeks rather than for six weeks, but you just are consistent and you just really step on the brake as much as you can, you start to get these numbers down. And, you know, this is basically, this is like just ripping a Band-Aid off. We'd rather do it fast and strong and the pain is less and is shorter. Even if we were to achieve theoretically, but we haven't started with this way, but we, get, we need to go into that now, you know, just a really strong lockdown, 
just for four weeks, we will be much better off than having, you know, a soft lockdown full of compromises for six weeks. You see this here. And when we then think about, you know, the late indicators, hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths, you can imagine this makes a hell of a difference here. And of course, if we then do this hard lockdown longer, then you will get numbers down to an essential extent. And that's the situation here. If we're on this trajectory and vaccinate, continue to vaccinate the way to save our summer. That's what you see with this green dashed curve down here. Very, very nice. So once to just summarize then, if, if those of us who are looking for some sort of semblance of some semblance of normalcy for the summer, our only chance is really through the uh, the third possibility. Is that right? Yes, we need to go into the green curve and do that long enough. The better we get, the more we help all of us, you know, the better this will all work out. This is one of the challenges we're having, especially, you know, in, in Western political systems. We're all individualists, etc. Our politicians are also accustomed to that. So politicians think in short-term gains. You know, politicians are not accustomed and not conditioned to uh, basically... Um, um, go through and uh, be successful with the marshmallow test. This is all about short-term gain, economic considerations, etc. that then let you potentially just, first of all, react late. And then, and this is an international phenomenon, have we not special in Ontario, let's face it, and then just compromise. What you then just end up with is in something which actually is much more painful, much more economically impactful, etc. The best bet, and to be honest, if I could go back to last October or so, uh, I would have been much stronger, you know, uh, also, also, you know, to suggest that we do that there. But what you see here is the best bet is act strong, fast, bring this, this down, and then you are able, you know, to start to perhaps approach this a bit differently and then fully benefit from the vaccines. That's really important. We can't benefit from the vaccines when we're already a mess, then the force of infection is too large. Remember, a vaccine is never 100% effective. Even the great vaccines that we're having, they're much better than flu vaccines, for example. They're only 90% effective. The more cases you have out there, the higher the force of infection, basically, the more cases you have, even when vaccinated, to actually bounce back and are infectious and transmit the disease, etc. If you want to benefit most from the vaccines, you need to be on the green curve, need to do this long enough and then the vaccine effect kicks in much more beautifully. And would we be correct in assuming that if you if you were able to act, uh, vaccinate more aggressively you'd you'd succeed in making that green dotted line go a little bit lower. Is that would that be correct? Yes, but you see the the point now is that's really important. You know, we it's it's it, th th there's a real misunderstanding there. You know, this is also, of course, Bay, uh, just just part of shifting responsibilities from province to uh, to uh, to federal level, etc. You see that here. Um, you have possibilities to deal you, you, just with, you know, 300,000 doses. All of a sudden, Disneyland happens, and we are able to apply. Also, you know, just uh, consistently in the province, 300,000 doses per day that we get miraculously from somewhere. Let's assume that's the case. If we again just continued, had continued with the soft public health measures, measures that, uh, that, you know, were in place um, beginning of April, look at what happens. You know, that's the problem. You will still make it easily to 20,000 cases before this peak. So even if a miracle happens and Pfizer decides, wonderful, Canada is our favorite country after Israel, we give them everything we have. You still need public health measures. And when you then just think about that, you know, that's then the story down here. You know, that's our public health measures strong with 100,000 doses as compared with public health measures strong with 300,000 doses, this doesn't make the big difference. The, the game changer in this situation is not the vaccines, it's the public health measures. Only later, when we're down here and are able to deal with this properly, then the, vac the, the, uh, the, the vaccines will start to be the game changer. 
Very good. So in the short term, it, having more vaccines is more like icing on the cake. It's not the real. The real exactly. Real. And that's, again, something which is very difficult to convey. Sometimes I, my impression is it's more difficult to convey to politicians than to the people, actually. <laughs> An interesting thing, uh, something you pointed out before, that uh, uh, a calculation that all of us had done early in the pandemic, that a, that a hard early intervention is more effective than a soft uh, intervention over a longer period of time. It's more expensive to do that, actually. It's really the case. And again, that's so difficult to understand, you know, hit early, hit hard, and then reopen again. There was this wonderful paper actually coming from Israel very early on discussing that, you know, and we should actually, we should frame this paper and should have taken it much more seriously. Hit early, hit hard, bring the numbers down and then open carefully. Only, you know, we know that, you know, Israel messed it up too, you know, during two waves. And then I'll just get it under control because now they reacted in the end well with the lockdown and then were even able then to really just saturate nearly the situation with vaccines. So thanks, Peter. That was very uh, helpful to walk us through that. Those slides, I know the slides when uh, Steini presents them are just chock full of material and it takes a while to unpack them. So thank you for taking the time to explain that. I want to chat a little bit now about transmissibility. And I know, Samira, you're an expert on this. So I want to ask you, especially in the context of uh, the variants, uh, what affects the transmissibility of the different variants? We have the wild strain, and then we have B117, which we say is 40% uh, or 50% more transmissible as a dominant variant. And then we have other variants, P1, uh, and other variants coming in. What, what affects their transmissibility as a uh, as an immunologist, as a virologist? How would you how would you help us to understand that? Well, I think the short answer is we're still understanding what the exact mechanisms and um, determinants for transmission are. But just to to expand on that, I mean, transmissibility obviously is multifactorial, right? It's not a singular viral determinant, and it's not necessarily a singular um, behavioral or epidemiological determinant. It's all of these things in combination. And um, we, we, the variants of concern we'll, we'll come to in a second, because obviously there, there's, there's heightened transmission with this, but we actually saw this before. Um, if you think back to last spring, there was a variant called D614G um, that emerged. And it's a little bit different in Canada because it dominated from very early on. So we had more what we would call ancestral or parental virus. Um, you know, uh, end of January when our first case came and, and peppered through, through February. But then it was replaced fairly early on by this D614G uh, virus, which really is now our kind of contemporary, you could even call it our, our vanilla uh, virus that 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 the VOCs are replacing, but that D614G virus actually had uh, an enhanced transmission phenotype and was worked on by a number of individuals. Um, it it didn't seem to get as much attention. It did not confer enhanced uh, severity, um, but probably contributed pretty early on to the massive burden of, of SARS coronavirus 2 on, at a global level. It very rapidly became the dominant strain in, in most jurisdictions. Um, so that was actually helpful because some of those changes that were associated with D614G kind of gave us a, an initial hint that this virus is not static. Mm -hmm. We don't have a heap of experience relative to influenza virus in terms of what we would call the molecular clock, uh, you know, how, how quickly the virus changes, where it changes in the genome. It's likely not fixed. It's probably somewhat fluid across, across the genome. Well, let me tell you, the variants of concern now have, have really underscored that this is not theoretical. It's, it's, it's a real thing. Um, the variants of concern have changes across their genome. It's not solely in the spike protein, but it's really been the ones in the spike protein that have been associated with enhanced transmission, probably enhanced disease as well. Um, and we, we were forewarned a little bit. If you look back at some of the literature, um, 
you know, people were mouse adapting this virus. They were doing mouse adaptation because it's a good model potentially to, to look at antivirals and vaccines and other things because your run of the mill laboratory mouse was not is not susceptible to this virus. So you either needed to use a transgenic mouse that expressed the, the, the viral receptor, so ACE2, or you needed to adapt the virus to the mouse ACE2. Mm -hmm. So when people, the way you adapt a virus is you pass it, you pass it in, in animals and, and look at adaptations. And the N501Y was one of those adaptations. Mm -hmm. um, so it was described before the VOCs emerged. And it was one of the reasons I think that, you know, the VOCs were, were highlighted as a possible, um, uh, a possible concern was because they had this adaptation that was also associated with enhanced binding so I, I won't, I won't, it's, it's Friday night, so I don't want to put people to sleep with all the details of the viral life cycle, even though that's what keeps me awake at night. I, I don't think you'll put anyone to sleep because people are intensely interested in understanding this. So please go ahead. Well, um, so essentially the virus obviously has to bind to the host cell. I think we all understand that now that the ACE2 is, is the, is the receptor, host cell receptor that we harbor and a number of other mammals as well. We've, now found out that uh, mustelids, um, you know, so 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 ferrets and mink harbor harbor this uh, receptor and are permissive for viral infection. So not, it has to bind the cell, and there are varying degrees of what we call avidity or strength of binding. And and the VOCs, some VOCs, have been associated with with that. So uh, obviously, I won't go through all the different mutations because there are a significant <laughs> number of them. But those are the ones in the receptor binding domain. And then um, actually getting into the cell involves a couple of, of fusion steps um, and cleavage steps, sorry. So, so some of the changes in these VOCs may also be implicated in, in letting the virus get into the cell. And what we mean by that is this virus is in a, a membrane. So to get into the cell to be able to replicate, it actually has to get out of that viral membrane so that the RNA can get into the cell. Mm -hmm. So these are what we call the steps in viral entry. So some, you know, there's a, there's certainly enough data to suggest that these viruses may bind better and may also uh, replicate uh, better inside the cell. And, you know, where they replicate can also be important. Um, so if viral replication happens in the upper airway and people are shedding more virus from the upper airway, that might be one way that they transmit or one reason or mechanism that they transmit a bit better. Right now, there's very, there are very scant data on um, whether or not the virus survives better in air or the VOC survive better in air. So at this point, there's nothing to suggest that they survive better in air, though I have to underscore that those data are limited. Um, even though we work in level three, I myself don't have the nerve to aerosolize this virus. So uh, they do that kind of work um, in highly specialized laboratories. So that's another reason why there's still some gaps in our knowledge is because of some of the containment requirements um, to really understand this virus. We really don't know, and I think it'd be very interesting and important to look at whether or not there's more resistance to, to disinfectants or longer survival on surfaces. Again, there's nothing to suggest that's a possibility, but that seems some, like something we should look at. Um, so, so obviously we're all, I'm very focused on biological um, implications, but, um, and virological implications, but there, there are also perhaps some immune determinants. So if there's immune escape, that might be another means by which the virus um, can continue to replicate and be transmitted. And, and you know, there's a th enough data to suggest that some of these variants may be um, evading immunity to, to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. Um, it really feels very much, you know, coming back to what Peter was saying and looking at those graphs, it really feels like fighting a wildfire. That's when I, I look at those numbers, um, you know, there are these, these smoldering transmission um, chains that are probably somewhat cryptic, um, you know, that are either escaping surveillance or, or, or just are underreported um, or unrecognized for other reasons. And I think that underscores the importance of, of really maintaining, um, you know, these, these public health measures that uh, I think from other jurisdictions we know if you pull back too early. So we've talked about locking down hard and fast, 
but I think we should also underscore the importance of not pulling, you know, take, taking the foot off that brake too mm -hmm. fast either, because we've seen in other jurisdictions, you know, these VOCs, because they're so, they are apex adapters. They are so good at transmitting that you don't really need a lot to break through. And it's like a wildfire, you get another, mm -hmm. you know, another flare, right? So we're going to have to be really, really vigilant, I think, um, to mitigate further spread. And as we make decisions about hopefully coming out on the other side of that peak when 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 we can actually because all the scenarios that you showed Peter there's there's some viral activity pretty much consistently all the way through when we'll get to zero I don't know but but it's really important that people understand that our aim is to bring things down as much that we can test and trace so that we can stay at a level where we don't end up in exponential growth. We call that this the stochastic phase, you know? It's just, it's it's always there. It's really like the smoldering wildfire, but you have enough firefighters to keep it under control. But the problem is if something changes, for instance, you know what we have seen in 1918 and in 2020 in Switzerland, there's an Annals of Internal Medicine paper for those of you who are interested that we published just a few months ago about that. In the same week, in October, it was actually eerie, it got called in Switzerland, okay? And they had opened up during, during uh, both situations far too early and far too carelessly. It got called, and in the same week, 1918 and 2020, in October, the shit hit the fan, literally. No? And it ne needs very little. When, once you're out, and to remember again, when you make a mistake today, you start to see it only 10 to 12 days afterwards. And if you're asleep at the steering wheel, you pay all of that very dearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a question here related to um, the variants. Uh, as Samira was describing, there's a lot that we don't know, a lot that, that we are investigating. Uh, Stephen Catola asks in the chat, uh, given that we don't know so much about the variants, how can we do the modeling uh, uh, where variants are playing such an important role? Peter, do you want to say something about that? Yes, I think there are two aspects. One is what we start to see, and keep, keep in mind, I'm just a garden variety general internist and epidemiologist, not an evolutionary biologist. But what, what I learned from my evolutionary biologist is that there may something go on here, which is called evolutionary convergence. And we, of course, all of us, you know, humanity uh, has also has experienced the same. In different parts of the world, humans start to, uh, the, to have the same sort of mutations that gave them an edge, okay? Viruses have these edges too. And what we now start to see in different parts of the world, it doesn't even have to be the same mutation. Um, two things that apparently give them an evolutionary edge. One thing is, as, as uh, you know, pointed out by Samira, viruses like to latch easier onto the cells, that's one type of mutation. And for three out of uh, the, the, the variants of concern that we're talking about, all of them have the same type of mutation there that they latch easier to the cells. This helps us to understand that when we start to see an observation in, in the UK and start to see that, you know, these variants in the UK are about 40 to 50% more transmissible, it makes sort of sense, even though we can't pinpoint it exactly to assume that the same sort of, you know, latching easier to the cell results in the same sort of uh, increased transmissibility also for the variants originally detected in South Africa or Brazil. The second story is that it seems that these buggers just try to uh, be subversive with the immune system. And two of the variants that we have, the one in Brazil, B1, and B1351, originally detected in South Africa, have a mutation in common again that basically allows them indeed to subvert the immune system, to escape it only partially and therefore also partially escape the vaccine. Doesn't mean the vaccines are not efficient. Most of them are. Um, so the mRNA vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna are still 60% effective, not 90% anymore. 60% is still much more than the flu vaccine has. That's okay. No? Now what we see, you know, there's now this scary 
uh, term double mutant, Ooh, you know, coming from Israel, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from India. It's the same story as before, but it's different mutations. And it could well be, we don't know that yet. And Samira needs to talk about that. I'm now need to be careful, you know, that I don't play, uh, you know, just embarrass myself here. But I just continue and then hand over to Samira. And basically, when we look at some of the mutations, it seems that there are again two that do similar things, but it's not the same mutations. And I need to hand over to you, Samira, that you actually just get get me out of trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, Peter, what you said is, is completely accurate. I mean, um, so similar mutations in the sense that the 484 is involved, but it's a different amino acid change. And we know less about that one than we do with the E484K. Um, of course, this virus always figures out a way also around our screening. Um, so, so people I think now are looking at their 484 screening to determine whether or not we would pick this variant up. And then the other change is the 452, which is also seen in a variant or a lineage that emerged in the US um, not that long ago, um, originally described in California, and it has been associated with, so that particular change, so again, we, we shouldn't you know, conflate the two. We don't know what this constellation of changes necessarily means, but that 1452 change in that other uh, virus, the one that was described in the US initially has been associated with 20% enhanced transmission and, and some of the other, what we call phenotypes or characteristics that, uh, that Peter has described. And uh, we know now that this, this um, variant called uh, B1617 is in Canada. Uh, and it sounds like it's now in three provinces at least. Um, so, you know, we have to be really vigilant. I think, you know, underestimating this virus is something that we do at our peril. I think really early on, people were saying it's a very stable virus. It doesn't mutate nearly as quickly as flu. And in a way that still might be true, but we know now that viral activity in humans increases the rate of change, you know, per thousand kilo base, uh, sorry, thousand bases within the genome you know, you give this, this virus an opportunity to adapt and it will. Um, you know, there's no reason why it wouldn't in a way. I think we were a little bit naive thinking, oh, it'll stay stable. And, uh, you know, as, as it's circulated more and um, there are now partially immune individuals, um, some would say that that's partly driving these mutations, but I don't know that we know entirely what's driving these mutations. And we've had interesting discussions around you know, is vaccination going to enhance selection or reduce selection because it's going to dampen viral activity to a point where there'll be fewer opportunities. But uh, every opportunity for transmission is also an opportunity for, for mutation. And it can also happen within the host. So there was some speculation that, and we'll never know, of course, like we'll probably never know the actual origin of this virus, which is probably a whole other discussion. But um, how these VOCs initially emerged, there was some discussion that it was from an immunocompromised host potential with prolonged um, viral replication who may or may not have been treated with convalescent plasma that might have enhanced selection. Who really truly knows? We can probably test it in animal models, but how translatable that is depends on the question that you're asking. So I, I want to, sorry, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Kumar, may I just uh, chip in quickly? You know, what Samira said also just points towards, again, the global nature of this pandemic and the necessity, not only from a humanistic perspective, but also from a pandemic control perspective to be in full solidarity with everybody. So if Bolsonaro screws it up in Brazil, we pay it dearly. If Johnson screws it up in the UK, we pay it dearly as well, and so will the rest of the world. But the other part is, if we now focus with vaccination and support just, you know, on ourselves, it will eventually backfire and come back. We need to get this globally under control. There's no way to do it differently. Right. right. Actually, it's calling for uh, leadership, really, in terms of uniting the world in, in a, and working against the virus together. Just on this question of um, how we're able to do the modeling when, when there's lots that we don't know about the variants, I might add that mathematically, there are only certain parameters that we need to get the models going. 
once you tell us, for example, that B117 is the dominant uh, variant and that it has a certain transmissibility, the model uh, kicks in and is able to do the rest. I want to come back later in the uh, in the discussion to variants again, but, but for now, uh, if we, we have a few more questions about transmissibility. Here's a question from uh, Martha. She's saying, uh, looking to the summer, it is an observation that the flu and probably COVID will have a lower transmissibility in the summer. If that's true, why? And if this is simply because of the effect of temperature and humidity on aerosols, should we avoid air conditioned, cold, dry environments in the summer? Samira, do you want to go first? Shall I go first? What do you prefer? Well, I can take a stab at it and you can tell me where I'm wrong. Um, so, I mean, that's correct. We know more data about uh, influenza virus and how much we can extra extrapolate to this coronavirus. I, I withhold judgment. This coronavirus has some similarities to flu, but probably more differences. Um, there's a modeler named Cecile Vivou who has done a lot of work around the seasonal, seasonality of flu. And not surprisingly, um, she's found that cold, dry temperatures are conducive to transmission. Obviously that's true in temperate climates like our own. Um, around the equator, you tend to see more sporadic influenza virus activity. It's not as uh, punctual in a seasonal, uh, from a seasonal perspective. And then in tropical climates, you tend to see higher levels of activity when it's actually humid and wet precipitation. Um, uh, has been associated with flu activity. So how much of that is biological or biophysical and how much of that is behavioral? I mean, what do we do in the winter? We go inside and, you know, depending on where you live, where I grew up, it was big bingo halls and, uh, you know, community suppers and, you know, you, you congregate. Um, so perhaps that's more important um, than the actual biophysical properties, but I admit, and please don't judge me, we actually tested this in an experimental model to see whether or not, and experimental, I mean, brick and mortar um, model to see whether or not in, a, in, in, um, in guinea pigs, the flu actually transmitted better uh, at a range of temperatures and relative humidities. And it did confirm that, uh, yeah, at low temperatures and low relative humidity, there is enhanced transmission. So there certainly is a biophysical component there um, that's not just based on, on behavior. I would say to answer the question about, you know, dry air conditioned spaces, I would say what you need, where you need to be are in well ventilated spaces. That's probably more important um, than the actual temperature or relative humidity, I'm thinking at least in the near term. Um, data will be forthcoming, there's no question. Again, I don't have the nerve to actually aerosolize this virus at a range of temperature and relative humidities, but no doubt those experiments will be forthcoming, but to me, it's really the aspect of congregating and poor ventilation that's going to drive transmission, whether it's in an air conditioned environment or not. I think that's probably secondary. It may play a role, but it's probably going to be secondary. And a preprint will come out next week that proves everything I say wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> that's the fun part of this, isn't it? Peter, you wanted to add so, Yes, yeah, so if I may add, think about Texas now, for example. It's probably really the case that um, what Samira said, you know, is just, it's all about ventilation. It's not that the other stuff doesn't play a role. If you have uh, more humidity, this means the small aerosols get more, you know, uh, water, basically, they get heavier, and they basically ha are more likely to fall to the floor eventually. That's great. But this is probably a really tiny part of the entire story. When you think about Texas, Texas is uh, too cold, and then it's too hot. And somewhere in between, that's where we are right now, is the sweet spot with great temperatures where people can be out. When you go back also with, uh, you know, the epidemic curves in Texas, if you go to, you know, uh, one of these uh, websites, what you will see is when it was too hot, the virus strived. And when it was too cold, it strived again. And when people are out, it strives less. 
Of course, we then have other aspects that also play in this, you know, when are summer holidays of kids, you know, there's not a single respiratory virus where kids don't play a role in transmission when they're in summer holidays, which is again also when, uh, you know, when it's warm and nice, et cetera, et cetera, then there's less happening. And it's then basically the perfect storm when they come back from summer holidays and it gets cold, everybody go, goes in and then the troubles start with a regular um, with a regular virus. What is really important is if you're in a pandemic, everybody is susceptible, not everybody, but many people. No, this is not the case with influenza and therefore we're struggling so much more. So uh, an influenza virus needs an additional push, no, that the, that the things get bad. Whereas for this one, especially at the beginning, especially in the absence of vaccines, not much was needed to get completely out of control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very good. Let's move on now to um, a question um, from Susanna. Um, she asks about people who mask in inadequately, such as not covering the nose, etc. As you know, the role of participation is very important in the effect that public health measures have. Um, by the way, a Fields Institute survey showed that about 30% of the population didn't feel the importance of masking and, and physical distancing. What would you say to the public about this and how might we help people to cooperate? Directed to whom? Uh, Shall I go you, first? You, sure, <laughs> why don't you go first, Peter? Okay, okay. Look, you're completely right, of course, with that. You know, we, so with, with the, the masking story, I mean, to be honest, the first thing which I find actually really humbling as an adult is um, early on, thanks to Michelle Science from Sick Kids um, last uh, September, we did a randomized trial of masking in schools with kids. The results are not all out, uh, so it's not published yet. But what we actually saw is that kids make much less of a mess with masks than probably we do. You know, that's again humbling. You know, we should just stop resisting and do the right thing. Masks have a function for um, both the one who carries the mask and the, one, and the people surrounding them. And I think it's important to really have a clear messaging, much clearer than what is currently going on, how important masks are, not only against the droplets, you know, that's the obvious one, you know, the surgeon that is having a mask, you know, in the operation theater and the protection is mainly against droplets, you know, with, uh, when, 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 he's, when he's there. But medical masks, cloth masks also partially, not completely, but partially also protect you against smaller particles in the air, uh, as small as the aerosols, but also everything in between. And the point is now, if we were to be better in that, you know, in just having two different aspects that we just try to emphasize. One is, I sound like a broken record, and I said it many times during the last two months, only some people didn't hear it. It seems outdoors is much better than indoors. But if you're outdoors closer than two meters, you would like to wear a mask. Why? There it's because of the droplets. Um, the aerosols are literally blown away outside because of the fresh air, no? And also probably because of additional disinfections through ultraviolet light. Indoors, you're in trouble, and it doesn't matter whether you're two meters apart or uh, four meters apart. It's all about wearing the mask consistently, and we would just need to message that clearly. And I think where we haven't been, as many other places, really consistent and clear is about the very simple messages about inside versus outside, about two meters distance, and about the mask. And then, you know, also just really making clear, like with the vaccines, this is not just only about yourself. But it's about, you know, everyone, and it's a deeply altruistic act to do the right thing. If you haven't seen this article, there is an absolutely beautiful article, and it's actually chilling, um, called Twilight Zone by a Canadian physician whose name I forgot. She's a beautiful writer, actually, um, who taught that's in the Los Angeles Times. So if you just Google Twilight Zone, Los Angeles Times, you will find this article. And it's really about what we can do or, can, or just don't do, the consequences it has, not for us, you know, visible, but for somebody who we don't know. 
you know, it's a beautiful article about that. And I think we need to, you know, tap into the altruism of people. Mm -hmm. This is such a, getting vaccinated, wearing a mask and staying two meters apart is, a, is a, essentially an altruistic act. I, I like that way of phrasing it, Peter, of, um, of, of not, it's not a matter of um, coercion of any kind. It's a uh, voluntary participation out of altruism and concern for, for, for our fellow um, uh, citizens. Samira, did you want to add anything to that, especially this relationship between outdoor and uh, indoor and uh, the uh, trans different transmission uh, uh, characteristics? I think that there are abundant data showing that indoor and congregate settings are, are, are higher risk for transmission relative to outdoor settings. I think what I'd like to underscore is what Peter said about altruism. I think um, you know, some people understandably consider bending the rules sometimes um, and just remembering that what might seem like a minor decision at that in that moment, you know, whether it's to meet up with friends or family or or forego, um, you know, restrictions around around congregation, I think realizing that it could lead to someone's grandparent or now potentially parent or sibling uh, ending up in, in critical care, maybe not someone you know directly, but, you know, two, three degrees of separation, right? Uh, you may or may never find out. So what seemed like very trite minor decisions on a daily basis mm. could have profound implications for a family weeks later. I think that, you know, everyone, I would be lying if I said, you know, you're not sometimes tempted, like, oh, maybe we should do X this weekend. And you just think, what if it, you know, if you, when you're making decisions, um, you know, they teach this to kids in schools, you know, make the right decision and think it through. Uh, it's not just about the immediate, what seems like a minor option that is harmless, completely harmless. Um, just the repercussions are so significant. And, and we have to keep reminding ourselves because we are all getting tired. We are all getting tired. And, and that reinforce, that constant reinforcement is important. And this this time gap is, is really a, a, a critical factor. You think, you know, you don't see it until much later, but actually what you do now is going to affect what happens two weeks from now. Yeah. yeah. That's a really important point. Um, there is a, another question in the chat here from Miriam. She asks that um, uh, going back to something that uh, Peter alluded to in the beginning, maybe if, if the government isn't willing to take necessary measures to bring down the numbers to avoid exponential growth, what are we as individuals supposed to do? Any comments on that? Yes. Um... I think it's what you're doing right now, what we all are doing. Again, it all depends on us. And, you know, adding to what Samira said just before, even if you have make a misstep tomorrow morning, every single step after that, where you actually just, again, try to be as, you know, um, safe as possible contributes. That's one of the other traps that people fall in. You know, that's like with safe sex. I once didn't use a condom, so I stopped using condoms. No, that's not the point. You slipped once. This doesn't mean that you have to slip just 10 minutes later. You don't have to. Nobody forces you and you make a difference. Every one of us makes one. So the point now is, if we all understood the severity of the situation we're in, that's, that's you know, why I keep trying to, to communicate also. If we all under, would understand that and just did the right thing, we wouldn't need politicians. We just did the right thing and it's okay. And it's very simple right now. Be outside, not inside. Wear a mask. If you're closer than two meters outside, always wear a mask when you're inside. And that's it. It's as simple as that. No more. Right. Simple playbook for everybody. Don't overthink it. Yeah, actually, the flip side of thinking like this is that I, we don't depend on the government. We, it's in yep. our hands. You know, It's in our hands to bend the curve. It's in our hands to, to bring the case numbers down. So that's actually, uh, in some sense, you might even feel it's an empowering way of looking at it. 
Okay, let me ask, sorry, Samira, did you want to add anything to this? Well, the only thing I have to add is it's an analogy that um, uh, one of the infectious diseases docs I, I trained with in Winnipeg, Ethan Rubinstein said, you know, if you're driving and you realize that your headlights are off uh, and you haven't gone off the road, when you realize that they're off, you turn them on, right? right. Um, same idea here. And I think this might go back to you know, the whole mask question at the beginning, because initially we weren't wearing them and some people may have thought, well, I didn't wear one and I didn't get COVID. Well, it's, you know, you turn on the headlights and you put the mask on. I think, you know, just because there are certain behaviors that didn't lead to, as far as you know, it may very well have led to other uh, transmissions. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't, um, you know, start, behaving in a manner that illuminates the way forward right and it's it is we're driving we're in the driver's seat in a lot of ways right right let, let me ask a question about contact tracing this comes from ai cheng he asks about contact tracing uh the fact that we don't really do contact tracing doesn't it mean that we are feeling our way in the dark in terms of transmission mechanism how much does that hinder our modeling? So he's asking, since we don't do contact tracing, how much does it harm the, uh, uh, affect the uh, quality of our modeling? Uh, either one can answer that. Maybe just start. Sir? Sorry? Uh, Samira, what do you want to go? Shall I go? What is your preference? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously having more, more data is very helpful. There was a nice paper, I think it was published in February, where they used contact tracing data to understand um, forward transmission so that they could look at viral load relative to, to, um, to transmission. And, you know, if we don't have that data, it's hard to have these more enriched conclusions that we can make. Um, I mean, I, I admit I'm not a modeler at all, so it's it's hard for me to say, but it seems obvious that it would have some some impact. It doesn't mean that there can't be some degree of modeling that's helpful or informative, even in the absence of content. Perhaps I may, may add there. So two things are important. Right now, we're in a period where contact tracing is completely overwhelmed. The point is, the task at hand is to get these numbers down so that we can start again with contact tracing and do a good job with that one. No? And, you know, we know a lot from contact tracing. For instance, there's a, there's a, a household study that is uh, currently under review. <laughs> being uh, being uh, that was conducted here in Ontario that reconfirms that the B one one seven the variant of concern originally detected in the UK is forty to fifty percent more transmissible. Period. No, that is basically it's based on contact tracing data. Contact tracing data is mainly here. Uh, sorry, not the data. The, the activity is mainly here in the first place to keep the wildfire smoldering. Mm -hmm. Yeah under control. Mm -hmm. Once you reach the cut where you can't do contact tracing anymore for everybody, you start to be in trouble. That's where exponential growth happens. So yes, we do contact tracing as long as we can. If things are as much out, out of control as they currently are, we simply can't because we don't have the resources. Exactly. So uh, just to add to that, the uh, contact tracing now is relevant for the new, new strains that uh, are not in high numbers. It's still practical for those, but but it's not practical once it sort of carries out of the bag and we're, we're in exponential growth. Okay, let me ask uh, now uh, uh, a question about vaccines. Uh, here's a question from Liz. She, uh, to either of you could, could address this. Uh, an interesting question. When all the adults are vaccinated, is it likely the virus will evolve to become better at infecting children? Does this make public health measures for schools, camps, and daycares even more important in the coming months? Yeah, either one of you can address that. Let me start with Samira. Sure, I mean, this is a question we've been wondering ourselves. Um, how much is immunity, be it from vaccination or from natural infection, going to drive viral diversity. So viral diversity happens one in one of two ways. You can get 
these mutations um, that may or may not change the sequence of the proteins, so the amino acid sequences. And you can also get recombination. So that means that there are two different viruses that kind of splice into one. So you get genomic um, components from two different viruses. And I think now I'm really speculating, but um, as we lower viral activity, some of some of these processes are likely to are less likely to happen. So if you reduce the amount of viruses that are circulating in communities and populations, you're less likely to have co-infections and hopefully less likely to have recombination. Would the would immunity actually drive changes? That's one question and it's possible that maybe not across the genome, but maybe in certain parts of the genome where there are epitopes, there might be some changes. I mean, this is what one of the reasons we think that, you know, flu evolves is because of immune pressure, right? That's what causes the, the drift in a way. And whether it, again, is from vaccination or, or natural infection is, is less perhaps relevant there. Whether or not it would impact children more, I really don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what, what you think, Peter. I, it's something that I, I, even if we were to look at it experimentally, I don't know that it would be something we could extrapolate, extrapolate at a population level, but certainly looking at reinfection and what comes out after vaccination is something we're planning on doing experimentally anyway. There's an entry, uh, the, the entry door into the cell, that's ACE2. Samira was referring to that. And we have some evidence. I actually lost track whether uh, some recent studies contradict that. But early evidence suggested that younger kids have a slightly lower density of ACE2 in, in uh, the mucosa, you know, where you actually get infected. Um, and we have some evidence from the UK, but they really didn't do a good job with masking and cohorting there, that when there was a lockdown in the UK and the schools were open, that B117, you know, that we now are all struggling with, actually was striving particularly well in kids. And uh, this makes perfect sense why the mutation, you know, that makes the virus latch better uh, to the human cells could potentially actually then just be present, you know, to uh, also just create more of a, uh, more infections in younger children. This is hypothetical from my perspective, but you know, that's probably what could happen. So the, the point right, right now is when you look at children, the older children probably behave very similar to adults. The younger children, one of the difference is indeed this ACE2 density in the nasal mucosa, which is lower in younger children. And the other part is that they seem to have an edge, probably because of co-infections, probably because of some elements in, you know, in their immune reactions that are different than adults, etc. All of that may be true. What this then eventually means Means. We don't know. The only thing I can tell is if there is this evolutionary convergence, you know, that the virus strives for latching better to the cells, that would be one of the mechanisms that would allow this virus also to strive in younger kids. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. You know, one of the aspects is we need to keep good public health, me health measures in schools. But on the other hand, if we vaccinate all the teachers and all the parents, the entry doors into the schools are closed, entry and exit. So if if we do that job well, this will also help our schools. Okay, very good, thank you. Let's uh, go now. I think the, the clock is moving sort of at some warp speed here, where uh, I, <laughs> the time is really passing uh, quickly. So I want to get to some interesting questions about uh, that have been raised by our uh, by our audience about longer term planning. I like this because these are optimistic. What happens after the pandemic? So uh, one question, maybe to, to Samira, you have mentioned in other conversations, the importance of a phenotyping pipeline strategy. And maybe you can firstly explain to us what, what is a phenotyping pipeline strategy and, and uh, what its potential would be in our ability to react quickly to new pathogens. Mm -hmm. So phenotyping is a pretty general term. You talk about the genotype. So that's the sequence of the, of, of the virus, but what are the actual characteristics that that changes in that sequence might impart? And here we're talking about variants, but if we're talking about the even bigger picture around preparedness, 
um, it's really about then looking at pre-emergence. So looking at coronaviruses that have potential to spill over and determine what the risk is for spillover to humans. And we actually don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is a really nice framework for that already in existence for influenza virus. So, you know, new influenza viruses reemerge because it reassorts. And so we get these um, uh, new subtypes. If we take, for example, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, and we put it through this kind of phenotyping pipeline that involves um, two, two approaches, really. One is biological or virological, and the other one is epidemiological and, and population level, and you have to do both. So again, just taking the example of influenza virus, if you have a novel influenza virus that's been detected because you're doing fantastic pre-emergent surveillance and you're, you're swabbing ducks uh, up north um, and, and, and you find a novel influenza virus, you determine whether or not it can actually bind uh, human cells, whether or not it can actually infect um, you know, the, the models that we use, like ferrets, for example, and whether or not it actually transmits in those models. So there's more the cellular, what we call in vitro aspect of things. So can it get into the cell? Does it replicate well? Does it damage the cell? And then at the level of the host, let's say if it's a ferret model, does it make them sick? Um, do they mount an immune response? Do they transmit to each other? And then you also look at what's happening in, in human populations. So you might maybe want, if no one's getting sick, that's the first thing you do, do Z surveillance. What about, what about zero surveillance? Or have people been infected with this thing? If there's anything to suggest that it might, might have potential to infect mammals. Um, and if so, have they mounted an antibody response? So really doing this type of phenotyping, again, it's a very loose term and, and depending on the virus and the, and, the, and, and the location, these are the kind of things that, that uh, we think about when we phenotype. When we think about the variants, the phenotyping, if we wanted to just be a little bit more myopic about it, really are around disease. So you can look at the, that again, experimentally, does it you know, damage cells more than, than, than what we would call a wild type virus? You look at transmission. So again, experimentally, you would look at that using, for example, a hamster model for, for transmission. And what about immune evasion? So, you know, pre-infected animals or pre-vaccinated animals, do they still get infected? And if so, do they transmit? And then you look at all of those same things at, at, at a patient level and a population level. So you phenotype it in the same way. Are people getting sicker with it? Or, you know, and you want to do these things in parallel because I ideally you, you know, when something emerges, you might have some hints from from the experimental work. Ideally, you would pick that up before you start seeing an impact on on human health. Mm -hmm. But as we saw with B one one seven, the signal was more human, right? People started looking at B one one seven because of the increased transmission. Um, so really, both have to inform each other. You can't just look at it from one way from just one perspective or another, but um, those same principles can kind of be applied to any emerging virus in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And we need to have that capacity if we were to be uh, in a state of preparedness for the future, is that right? Exactly. We don't want to wait to invent or find the models. You want models mm -hmm. that have all the paperwork approved and that, you know, the permits are approved and the, the protocols are approved and you could just go ahead and start. I wonder, uh, remember when in December, when all of you were discussing very intensely the situation with B117, it's kind of a miracle how quickly people turned uh, the sequencing and the, uh, the identification around. I think that's, 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 I mean, normally those things take much longer, don't they? Yeah. If you were starting from scratch, absolutely. I mean, there's no question we would have liked to have done it even faster, but because there were a number of centers that were already doing whole genome sequencing, you know, in a probably a more protracted timeline, if you can accelerate that and contract that timeline, but it's, it, it, you, can, you can generate a heap of sequences, um, but unless you have the analytical capacity and more importantly, unless you have the public health capacity to actually act on that. So it comes back to what you were saying a little bit earlier, Kumar, about, about 
you know, focusing some of the contact tracing around variants, that's only possible if you let you know, the public health folks know that there is a variant, you need to have a quick turnaround time. And for that, there's technical readiness, which I think we have, I think where, where some of us are struggling a little bit is more almost on the personnel side, you know, it was a very mm. specialized uh, thing in terms of actually doing whole genome sequencing. Luckily, we've been able to use screening as another method to, which uses PCR, which doesn't require as much, um, uh, technical expertise. It's more, it's more it's something more, you know, any technology lab could do. May I chip in and just give perhaps a little bit of a broader perspective regarding where we are with that. So I think we need to be aware of two things right now. Humanity was never as populous, numerous in a, on, the, on this planet. And we were never as connected as we are right now. So while, you know, the last really heavily hitting pandemic was the 1918 pandemic before this one, and it took 102 years to, to bring us there, and it took a world war and all the associated mobilities at the end of the world war, you know, to really make this global. It will not take that long anymore. So this preparedness that Samira was talking about is extremely, extremely important. Things will change. You know, there were many people out there, including poor Bill Gates, you know, who was preaching again and again for years, this will come, etc. And people did not listen. Right. And we have learned a great deal now. It starts very simple. When the next pandemic comes, nobody will be asleep at the steering wheel with, with travel restrictions. You know, we need to be draconic with travel restrictions. That's the big, big, big mistake that we all made at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And the other part, which is completely different, is um, we now have, with thanks to, uh, to a Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, two plug-and-play vaccines and an understanding for these plug-and-play vaccines that can be adapted. And we have a proof of concept that we can be fast. And I think these two aspects, reacting very early, if something's coming and having a vaccine technology at hand that actually works and can work in the future will be extremely helpful. But everything we're talking about here, you know, getting uh, illegal animal markets under control, being really, really careful that we have a global collaboration on what was what uh, Samira was saying, you know, these spillovers from animals to humans, that's really a Swiss federal disaster. And this happens really, and it happens, you know, uh, again and again and again. And sometimes, you know, that's just a random phenomenon. Rare events happen all the time. We are so many people on this planet and we're so connected. Sometimes you have what, what we've seen and it's most likely that the next pandemic won't take another 100 years to come. I, I probably, I will not be retired when the next is coming. And I really hope that we then react very early and then uh, that we get closed down, keep this under control and can vaccinate our way out because we had travel restrictions early. Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, will we remember the lessons that we're learning now? Will we translate that into action? That's a, that's a good that's a big if. I, I, mean, I hope. I hope the answer is yes. Did I hear you correctly, Peter, in saying that uh, the 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 vaccines that have been developed in in sort of very fast time, really, in terms of uh, the time it normally takes to develop a vaccine, also have some sort of um, uh, have actually you know, created a framework uh, by which they can be modified and uh, uh, um, uh, adapted to other viruses. Is that right? Oh, this is amazing. And I hand over to Samira because she will be explained the speci uh, be able to explain the specifics. But this is so much more flexible, you know, what we're doing with these mRNA vaccines. And I hand over to you, Samira, to explain it. I'm incompetent. No, not at all. I mean, you're you're spot on. It's it's much more plug and play, as you say, right? I mean, the RNA to encode proteins, that code can be switched out. And I mean, I think. I think it's probably fairly well known that individual uh, companies are looking at making VOC vaccines, for example, right? Or combinations. So, you know, these are things that, um, you know, I think where we're, we're, the technical, I keep coming back a little bit to the technical readiness is there, but some of the other pieces around it, for example, in Canada, I think where we have still a gap, I think it's being addressed, but biomanufacturing, right? 
if uh, so there are these vaccine platforms that are more nimble um, but you know unless we actually have the capacity to biomanufacture them domestically mm. I don't think we'll be much further ahead and I'll, I'll, although I do want to end on a positive note one sort of maybe more cynical aspect of all of this is I am worried you know, like Peter said, there are spillover events. Um, some of them probably, probably most of them burn out, but it's the interconnectedness, essentially our global interconnectedness catalyzed this. So, you know, OC43 is a seasonal coronavirus that spilled over several hundred years ago from cattle. And it probably didn't cause a pandemic because it just slowly marched across the globe over decades and centuries. Here, we managed to expeditiously distribute um, probably more efficiently than we could ever eat. Like had we tried, <laughs> we probably couldn't have done it more efficiently, distribute this virus across the planet. And my concern is that the behaviors that enabled that are probably not going to change mm. post pandemic. Maybe the surveillance will improve. Hopefully the surveillance will improve. The response will improve. But again, we're still in reactive mode. What can we do now to make sure that we don't, and I don't know the answer to this. I mean, do we encourage people to travel less? Is that actually going to happen? How do we actually, not. <laughs> you know, that, that's sort of my concern is a lot of this, uh, this was all, are we, I mean, we need to take responsibility. This was all catalyzed by human activity, right? Mm -hmm. What are we doing about, about that? Right. So the big conversation there that uh, I think we, we have to have and make, most importantly, we have to make sure people don't forget the lessons that have been learned, uh, that we're able to translate this into action. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. So each of you, please tell me, what do we need to do to have a summer? After you, Peter. <laughs> okay, okay. First of all, we need to really be realistic about where we are in this pandemic. We're, pandemics have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're very close to the last part, to the end of this pandemic, if we do things wisely. But this means right now, remember the marshmallow test. If we want to have a summer that is a real summer, we A, now need to be really strict with the next few weeks and help each other. Very simple. Until we really have enough people who are vaccinated. And when we make it into the summer, you know, I heard somebody say, you know, this will be like the Roaring Twenties uh, after World War I. Forget it. It won't be the Roaring Twenties this summer. This summer needs to be a very carefully handled summer where we still have quite a lot of restrictions, but it will not be much different, I would hope, than last summer, perhaps a little bit more that we already can do, but we cannot be overly excited right now. And we will have an acid test that's coming, which will be autumn when it gets cold again. And we need to be aware of that. And we don't know how this all will play out exactly. But if we want the summer and not be in lockdown, we now need to get these damn numbers down. Right now, remember the green curves? That's where we need to be very soon. Samira? I think it's going to be a summer of slowness, you know, no, no racing to the beaches, no racing to, uh, well, outdoors is better than, than indoors, but, you know, we, no racing to reopen. I think, you know, if we, it's that delayed gratification, right? If we want to have the fall and we need to constantly remind ourselves of that. And I think that's true if we want to have a future in some ways, right? Like we need to just uh, slow down and, and, and take stock and plan now as to what we could do over the course of the summer to enable all of this. And one thing we, I know we only have one minute left, but, um, you know, we haven't really talked about where the, the, the active viral activity has really been and, and, you know, vulnerable populations are, you know, what, what are their summer options? You know, some, some people, um, have don't have as many summer options in terms of right. what what this looks like and i think we all individually need to think about 
how we make it easier for everybody, not just ourselves. I think we're still very, mm -hmm. we do a lot of navel gazing. We need to look up and, and, and look at the horizon and see how we can help everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Because it will, what we do will make a difference for, for everyone in the community. I think that's that's a really important point, a good point to sort of bring the discussion uh, together at the very end. We're in, you know, the the society is interconnected, the world is interconnected. Uh, society is not homogeneous; it's heterogeneous. And um, if any one section of society is in trouble, we're all in trouble. Um, and so, if we're going to learn the lessons of the past, if we're going to conquer this, we're going to have to work together. We're going to help help each other. I really like the idea of viewing this as uh, altruism, service uh, to each other. Um, but at the same time, I don't. I, I mean, could I could I ask? Would you agree that um, it's it's not a doom and gloom scenario? I mean, it's a question of doing the right thing now, and there is a way out. There is a way forward. Uh, and so we can be cautiously optimistic, um, alert and vigilant and, and know that we are part of the game. We have a role to play. Would that be a, a fair way to describe it? Yeah? Yes, for sure. You, both of you for nodding. Sure. So that's really good. So uh, we're unfortunately out of time, but I really want to thank both of you. So you took uh, uh, the trouble to come and join us and share your thoughts. It's clear as I'm listening to you that I could enjoy many, many more hours of conversation with you. Uh, some of what you're saying I've heard before in, in committee meetings, but, but uh, it, it'd be really good in an informal setting to just explore. And I think the, the audience has been pretty strong with us as well. So I think uh, it's not just uh, my view, but uh, the view of, the, uh, of our audience as well, that uh, they enjoyed your comments. So to the audience, as I hope you've uh, found it useful. Um, the Fields Institute uh, is a math institute. We do math, but but we're in a public crisis. We're in a health crisis, and and in and in the sense of altruism and service, the institute is ready to to play a role, especially in communicating accurately um, and uh, unbiasedly uh, the state of affairs, and to help people understand what they can do, what they uh, uh, where we are, and what what they can do going forward. So we're happy to organize more such events. There is, in fact, another event coming two weeks from now. You'll see the announcement shortly. Uh, once again, our, our prayers for everyone's well-being, wherever you're joining us from uh, in the world. Uh, I hope you're well and your family and loved ones are well and that you're taking care of yourself. Please stay safe and healthy. We will get through this. As, as Peter said, we are near the end. Uh, uh, but uh, there's still a, um, a, a difficult phase to get through. Uh, and hopefully we will have a big celebration when we reach the other side. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Samira. And have a good night.